Hello, my name is John Gabriel and this is the new Calculus channel. Today I'm going to be discussing the Zermelo-Frankel axioms, or what I prefer to call beliefs. And I will show you in this presentation that those set of beliefs are completely absurd and fail from the very first belief. But now, what I'd like to do before I continue is point you to <clears throat> a YouTube video by a mainstream academic called Frederick Schuller, and the URL is up there, so you can actually use that URL to access this particular video. Um, he he basically describes the axioms of set theory and there are many other videos that you can read up or that you can watch and see how different they all are from each other in other words even mainstream academics don't really have the same interpretation of set theory how could they it's so complicated it's full of uh, self-referential uh, definitions structures and it's based on complete rot. Um, for example, if you had to watch this video here on MIT Open Courseware, it's substantially different to the approach Schuler takes in his video. And if you try to watch a third video, chances are that will be different too. So you have a lot of different views of what are these beliefs, even though they're supposed to be the nine common beliefs or axioms. So. Um, set theory is predicated. Now, what is a predicate? A predicate is actually a noun which refers to the verb in a sentence. Okay, so they're predicated on the belief that there is a fundamental relation between any two objects in the universe, and they denote that predicate by some symbol. In this case, they chose the Greek letter epsilon, or what you see here. Um, in the red font, this particular symbol is chosen to be the predicate, but it could be any symbol, it doesn't really matter. So <clears throat> they start off by uh, postulating a relation, as you see in this line here. So you can have one object is related to another object, and all that means is that object one is either contained in object 2 or it belongs to object 2. And there's a, a, a slight overlap of meaning in those two expressions. The objects can be called by any other name as long as they are nouns. And in that case, <laughs> the relation is purported to hold. Um, but it may not hold if the objects are not sets. But what are sets, you may ask? Well, they haven't been defined yet, but it turns out that even after the objects are defined, that these two objects need to be sets. Otherwise, this relationship here, or this relation operator, does not hold. So from the offset, there's a lot of circularity, and it's just a load of garbage. But let's continue. So, for example, idiot is an element of idiot. By the way, element hasn't even been defined yet. Um, in this case here that you're looking at here, the predicate may indicate sameness or equality. You can say idiot is an element of retards or is in retards. And in this case, the predicate may indicate ownership. On the other hand, uh, an epsilon with a stroke through it indicates no relationship. So, for example, uh, intelligence or mainstream academic is not an element of intelligent people, right? You could actually have a relation like that. So, the verb may is used because a collection of nine beliefs are used to define the objects that are all given the same name, which is set. So, to be called a set, any object must conform to the nine beliefs, otherwise it is not a sacred object, that is, a set. And here is a scheme, which is very circular. 
So this relation operates on objects, as you see in this line here. And then it is checked by the number of beliefs which actually use the relationship operator. So again, circularity in between all of these. And then finally, some kind of conclusion that the object is the set. The beliefs are those attributes which only a set can have, but a set hasn't been defined yet. Yet somehow an object can exist whether or not it has those attributes, but it cannot be a set until it satisfies all the beliefs. This ridiculous and laughable nonsense was intended to replace the common notions in the true foundations of mathematics, the elements. The very first of these beliefs is that if the objects contain the same parts, suddenly these same parts are called elements, which can also by themselves be called sets, and they are still undefined. Then the objects are the same, something like a, you know, the Russian Matryoshka doll scheme. Okay, given that a containment, given that containment and belonging are subject to interpretation, a set does not get to be called a set until it graduates <laughs> by memorizing all the nine beliefs. However, if objects contain the same parts, they may not qualify as sets if they fail to satisfy one of the beliefs. Those are actually referred to by set theorists as problem sets, which by the way is a contradiction in itself. Either it is a set or it isn't. And an example of a problem set is the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Such a set is devilish, and it's not allowed in set theory. So what can we conclude about the first belief? We need to be using sets, and we don't know if there are sets till they satisfy all the requirements. But we still have to believe they are equal sets if they are the same set. How do we compare objects if we do not know what they are? Think about that. How do we compare objects if we do not know what they are? So set theory starts without any definitions. On this basis alone, the first belief is false. We cannot tell if objects are the same unless we know beforehand what those objects are. Not only can we not tell if they are the same, but we cannot tell if parts of those objects are inside the objects unless we know what they are. The rot of set theory was meant as a replacement for the sound mathematics of the ancient Greeks. Now there are actually four common notions in Euclid's elements which I've summarized and they are all one needs to know about objects without beliefs or any other uh, intriguing weird notions. And here they are. One, Objects that are the same as a given object are the same as each other. If objects are changed in the same way, then the objects are still the same even after they have been changed. An object is not the same as any of its given parts. Now, in any of those three, the word object or the word same can be replaced by equal. So, mainstream orangutans have tried to replace these simple comprehensible notions with their set of beliefs. It turns out that all the nine beliefs are false. And this is what can be expected when concepts are ill-formed and definitions are ignored. So for more than 200 years, they have abandoned, the mainstream academics have abandoned the light and beauty of Greek mathematics for the absolute rot of set theory, where bijective cardinality gives rise to infinities of plenty, to infinities of plenty, and Aleph, numbers, reign supreme. There are no axioms or postulates in mathematics, and there is only one perfect derivation of number. I recommend that you read these two articles of mine on LinkedIn. The one here is a proof that there are no axioms or postulates, and it gives a systematic derivation of every one of the so-called postulates. They're actually not postulates. There are the five requirements, and also a perfect derivation of number, um, which does not require any undefined notions or anything else of the sort. And so, um, I hope you've enjoyed this video and that you'll join me again next time for another interesting uh, exposition. 
I'm John Gabriel, and this is a new ch the new calculus channel. Goodbye.